Damian Monticello, and I am SHFM president. My day job is senior manager, corporate hospitality services with GuideWell. Thank you so much for joining us today, and once again, welcome. I also want to say a tremendous thank you to the generous SHFM annual sponsors. These companies have stepped up to provide the resources we need to offer timely and educational events like this one. Thank you so very much. Before we begin, I do have a few reminders for you. Please ask your questions throughout the session in the Q&A window in your toolbar. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end, so be sure to ask those questions throughout the session. I see several attendees already utilizing the chat window. We'd love to know you're here with us, so please drop us a friendly hello. This session is being recorded, so it can be played on demand. The recording will be available on the SHFM website and YouTube, YouTube channel later this week. And finally, there will be a 60 second evaluation for this session that will show up in your browser when the event ends or should you have to leave early. Be sure to share your thoughts with us so we can continue to deliver SHFM's quality content and events. We have some phenomenal speakers and timely content to get to today, so let's get with it. I'd like to introduce today's session moderator, Barry Scown. Barry is a 21 year veteran of the food service consulting firm, Cine Little International, and is currently the director of their management advisory services division. He's been in the food service industry for the past 40 years since graduating from the University of Denver's HRM school and starting as a restaurant manager with Weston Hotels for his first five years. Barry's credentials also include two years as director of operations from one of the major contract food service management companies. Barry, over to you. Thank you, Damien. Really appreciate that. And thank you also to SHFM for helping us broadcast this very important webinar. I'm really excited to be your moderator today. And I'm also very honored to work with our distinguished group of panelists on this topic. So let's jump right in. I'd like to introduce our four panelists today, starting with Paul Fairhead. Paul is the Chief Executive Officer for ISS Guggenheimer, and he helps bring vision to life in his role at Guggenheimer uh, for, over the, uh, for over the past 20 years of his career, working at the intersection of the food business and the facility services industry. Paul's unique background means he can keep up with the business demands while still celebrating culinary creativity at Guggenheimer. He has been with ISS Guggenheimer since 2008, where he has, had set, has held several leadership positions and roles in operations and in food services. Next up is Matt Howard. Matt is currently the Director of Business Development at FUDA. Uh, for the past five years, Matt has been working with companies to help design food programs to meet their growing needs. Initially, Matt started in the contract segment with the Compass Group before moving to move, move, moving to FUDA, FUDA. <laughs> and, uh, and Matt brings a very unique look into, into the traditional employee dining program, as well as newer corporate dining concepts. Matt is a graduate of West Point in 2011 and then served as an officer in the Army Rangers from 2011 to 2016. So welcome, Matt. Next up is Lexi Kieran. Lexi is the current Vice President of Operations with LifeWorks Restaurant Group, and Lexi joined LifeWorks in 2016 and currently oversees operations nationally, while also leading LifeWorks' strategy and innovation initiatives. Lexi has more than 15 years of domestic and international food service operations experience, having worked in both the U.S. and Europe operations. So welcome, Lexi. And last but certainly not least is Scott Roque who is currently the Director of Business Development with the Epicurean Group, which is based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Scott uh, has had a 30-year tenure in the food and environmental contract service world, and he has held both senior and operational and sales positions during that time. His career has allowed him to develop expertise in several factors of the business, including healthcare, employee dining, or B&I dining, as we call it, and senior residential care. Scott's experience has taught him that a company's success is directly affected by the passion and drive of the hardworking people in the field. Okay, so now that we know who our panelists are, we wanted to start the session with just a fun icebreaker question for everyone to get the conversation rolling. 
and then we'll do a deep dive into this very important and very relevant topic. So panelists, here's your fun question. If you were rescued off a deserted island after six months of eating nothing but coconuts and seaweed, what would your first meal order consist of on the mainland? So Paul, we'll start you off with the answer to that question. Okay, thanks, Barry. So I think uh, if I've been eating coconuts and seaweed for six months, I've probably lost a few pounds. So therefore, I could um, I'd go for a, probably a ribeye steak, medium rare, uh, Bernay sauce, French fries, green beans on the side, and um, then probably wash down with a glass of uh, Austin Hope. All right, Matt. I would have to say um, I would I would go with I'd say a half dozen, but since I've been on an island, maybe a dozen. Uh, just traditional corn tortilla street tacos. Um, I think that'd be, and I guess I'd also wash that down with a cerveza. <laughs> Sounds great. Lexi? Um, for me, I, I do love fish and coconut, but after six months of eating that, um, I think I'd probably be craving some comfort food. Um, so for me, it's probably a very traditional Neapolitan pizza. Um, I have a favorite restaurant in New York, I, I have in mind. Um, and with that, a nice cold glass of Prosecco or Lambrusco. And I do have a major sweet tooth. So um, I probably need um, a lemon tart, a cannoli and some gelato then for dessert to, <laughs> to round it all out. So that would be me. Uh, awesome, awesome. Scott? Well, for me, I'm just grateful that I probably have lost those 10 pounds that I've been trying for the last year and just can't seem to get them off. So let's let's just say I succeeded at that. And now I can enjoy a sustainable Maine lobster tail uh, from the Monterey Sea Watch, of course. And then um, I would have to go with that steak that Paul is suggesting as well. And then French fries sound good as long as they're really crisp. Um, and then with Lexi, I, I would have to have that sweet tooth and it would be a hot fudge sundae. Uh, with chocolate chip ice cream and then a chocolate chip cookie on the top so that I could have the best of all worlds. And Barry, you're asking this right before lunch. So I'm not so sure that this is a fair question, but we'll move right to. That's great. All right. Well, let's get started with the with this topic because this is so important and so uh, so affecting everybody on this call and in so many ways. So let me start the panelists off with a question first. Um, what are the challenges your organization faces in rehiring the hourly and management workforce required to serve your clients as they start to reopen later this summer and even this fall uh, as things go? So Paul, why don't, uh, why don't you start us off with, uh, it's a very broad question, but why don't you start us off with uh, a reply and, and we'll open it up to everybody. Okay, thank you, Barry. So I think for me, like you said, it's a broad question. So probably falls in three main buckets. I think the first one is timing. The reality is, you know, I think through the next few months and probably September onwards, we're going to see a significant ramp. And so the kind of world's going to turn on a bit like a light switch and we're going to have to respond very, very quickly because hotels are going to be back to probably more typical populations. Our schools will be going back, you know, a more regular basis. And so all of that, you know, creates obviously demand on the workforce. So I think the timing aspect is going to be really key. And so building a plan to really have the, the, you know, the teams ready you know, before September, I think is going to be some key to success there. I think the other piece is, I mean, COVID's been the great reset, I think, for a lot of us. We've seen a lot of changes in people moving out of cities, perhaps you know, moving to those SMCs, those small, medium cities, you know, really you know, looking to understand work-life balance, et cetera, in a better way. And so I think you know, looking to how we can support our workforce in terms of agility. So perhaps your know, part-time your know, workforce, looking at alternative you know, um, workforces, et cetera, as we come back is gonna be really, really key. I think the, the other big challenge, honestly, as well, is you know, with people comes the business reopening, but the business has changed. You know, we're gonna probably have different services. We're probably gonna have different you know, controls that we need to put in post COVID, new protocols, new training. So I think the, the first challenge is, is recruiting the workforce. 
you know, the second challenge is then onboarding them correctly, setting them up for success, making sure they understand those new protocols so they can deliver services, you know, to our clients. So for me, that's the kind of the three big buckets that I think we're focusing on, but um, we'd love to hear from the panel um, on their views. Um, from from my perspective as well, the interesting thing that we're seeing out there, um, of course, there is the hourly war for talent right now, but then there is um, a, a different shift in a dynamic that we're seeing with the management, um, the, the leadership employees, there's a, those that are still currently employed, there's pent up demand. And so um, there are a lot of um, currently employed job seekers as well um, in management roles. So that's, um, that creates another interesting dynamic, good, good and bad. I also, for me, think it's important that we reach out and engage the workforce as a whole to let them know the positives of working in the service industry, because we, we all have developed a career and have enjoyed what we have done working with the public. And I think that it's important that they see those positive effects as they may have gone out and found other directions to, you know, produce and sustain themselves. So I think it's important that we promote that. Matt, anything to add, or what should we move on? Oh, no, I think the uh, the group handled it. Okay, great. All right, let's go on to our next question. How has your employee search and recruitment tactics and or practices changed since the onset of COVID last year and in the light of uh, the government stimulus packages that have, um, that have uh, been implemented sporadically throughout the last 12 months? So Lexi, why don't, uh, why don't we have you take the lead on replying for this one? Sure. Um, the short answer is it has changed dramatically. Um, we have had to move quicker and cast a wider net than we ever have had to before. And we have definitely started seeing a lower applicant flow since the most recent stimulus package has been approved. Um, but we certainly note that this trend is predominantly affecting our hourly roles. Um, in response, we've had to react very quickly and get more creative in, in finding and attracting talent. Um, not only are we opening job postings several weeks earlier than we would have in the past, but speed to engage those applicants has also been extremely important. Um, we're finding that many candidates are receiving multiple offers as well, so we need to make the entire process from start to finish as efficient as possible. Um, we've, also, we've also deployed additional recruitment tactics, some of which are enhanced referral bonuses for our associates, fostering engagement in our alumni networks, enhanced focus on our ground up recruitment through our S2L and A2L college internship programs, and communicating our value proposition. And by that, I mean actively marketing and attractive, uh, uh, marketing the attractive benefits we offer some of which are the fully funded tuition for hourly and management employees that we offer, um, our attractive schedules with no holiday or weekend work in our industry, and um, a good work-life balance with very few evening shifts. So at the end of the day, we find ourselves in the same predicament as so many other industries across the nation um, competing in this war for talent. And for the foreseeable future, we will be competing not just within our own industry amongst ourselves, um, but we're competing with the trade industry, the hospitality industry, transportation, manufacturing, construction, you name it. Um, so to win that war, we not, we not only have to offer competitive pay and benefits, but we have to hire smarter and quicker than we have ever had to before. So that's, um, that's my stance. Um, does anyone else have any other uh, views? I'll jump in there, Lexi. So I think, you know, completely agree in terms of, you know, looking at pay rates, looking at, you know, the, the complete kind of um, package there that we can offer, you know, employees. And I do think, you know, we, we probably don't spend enough time as an organization focusing on our employer brand aspect. I think, you know, in terms of, you know, what do we stand for? Who are we? And what does that mean for an employee? And how can we support, you know, their career growth? So I think that's really, really important, you know, all the way through this. And I think, you know, similar to you, you know, we're utilizing, you know, AI technology now more than ever in terms of, you know, a tool to really, you know, expedite that recruitment process, because it's such a large volume, and people can't afford to wait 
two, three weeks to find out if they've been you know, received that job. So you have to move fast. I think you know, speed is definitely a, a big uh, concern here. And I would just like to add that the stimulus package is not forever. It's going to end. And the long-term effects for those employees are, are very big concern for us. In fact, especially those that have been with us for a long period and maybe taking a little bit of what we call a recess and then moving on after September, we want to remind them of what we have and what we can produce for them and their lifestyle going forward that we want to not only protect, but grow as they move into other roles within our company. Uh, something that, that Lexi uh, mentioned that I also want to touch on, she, she mentioned the, uh, the referral uh, bonuses and things of that nature. It just speaks to really the offensive nature um, that we have to take in our approach of, um, you know, traditionally re recruitment is done through one arm of the organization, whereas now it's really everybody's responsibility um, to be engaging talent within their, uh, within their network. Um, just to see if, you know, who's looking for opportunities and, and, and keeping, um, keeping options open uh, and being flexible to people that are coming from outside the industry. Um, it's, a, you know, as, as Lexi mentioned, it's a great industry to be in. There's a lot of benefits to it um, and, and being able to engage with your, you know, your individual network um, to, to bring folks in uh, has, been a, has been a large effort uh, on our side. Alrighty, uh, let's go to another aspect of this. The, the restaurant industry uh, was slightly, obviously, a little different than the contract industry uh, in terms of the food service uh, segments. So how has the impact of the retail restaurant industry translated to the operating models, operating models for the contract management operators? Because we know a lot of, a lot of um, the oper major operators uh, do guest restaurants they do guest uh they may they might dedicate a menu station to a outside restaurant entity and in, and matt in your case it's it's pretty much all uh mostly that so i'll let you take the lead on this question and and tell us how that's uh maybe impacted your operating model to some extent yeah you know it's the restaurant space has been a really interesting um space uh to work within during throughout the throughout the the past year um, obviously, there's uh, been a large effort to, to remain engaged with our partners. Um, you know, certainly the restaurant industry is, is well, you know, the hospitality industry as a whole has been, you know, largely impacted um, by the, the events of the past year. And so, you know, one thing that we're seeing is we're very much engaged in um, understanding their business model and goals, um, something that may not have had to be as large of a focus. Um, but because, you know, we work so closely with restaurant partners, um, understanding the challenges that they have day to day, and they're, they're dealing with the same labor and talent challenges. Um, so remaining engaged with them and understanding their goals um, has been, uh, you know, a large part of our efforts. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is it actually is helping solve some of the problems um, that, that we're encountering um, you know, as people are starting to return to work and staying agile and nimble. And so, as you mentioned, uh, you know, I'm sure to, to some extent, everyone on this call has uh, partnered with a restaurant um, in some operation or another. And, and the ability to work with a restaurant partner that's looking for more hours for their associates um, and, and using that during the lunch period and partnering with a contract management company to bring that restaurant in also helps with some of the uh, agile uh, nature, or uh, I guess the dynamic nature of uh, the return to work. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, a building doesn't have a large population on a Monday or a Friday, um, but they do the rest of the week, being able to leverage a local restaurant that's looking for that revenue, looking for hours for their associates and inputting them into um, one of the stations can be a huge benefit, not just for our restaurant partners, uh, but also for um, the, the management, the contract management company, as well as um, our, you know, our, our uh, the employers themselves. And it's absolutely on us to support the communities in which we live and operate. And unfortunately, so many of these local restaurants have not survived the pandemic 
And so we truly feel um, a, a responsibility to help support the remaining small businesses and the yeah. remaining um, restaurants in our communities. And so by giving them the opportunity to come in and um, take over spaces within the cafe or even transition some of, some of our restaurants into food halls, um, it, it benefits us all and um, benefits the guest as well for the variety and for um, the knowledge and knowing that we're also supporting the community. You know, I live in a small community and I've been amazed at how much community support has come out since we've somewhat opened up. And I know that I was one who, most of the restaurants were closed. We do bring home, you know, something to eat, or uh, you know, I actually use my kitchen, which was a new concept at some point. But it was, it's become really a focus of our community, which we live in, to support those local restaurants and to help them grow and to help them be a little bit more intuitive of what we need as consumers. And I've been very impressed with all the support especially on the evenings that have come out to um, enjoy themselves and to support them, not only financially, but also, you know, encourage them uh, through giving them suggestions and ideas. It's been terrific. Yeah, I completely agree with my fellow panelists here. I think, you know, the community you know, responsibility that we have as, as large organizations here is, is key. And I think, you know, we've all been looking to see how we can support those, those local establishments to help you know, get them back on their feet and hope, hopefully help them grow significantly. So I think that's really key. And then I think, you know, um, the decentralized approach to food, I think, you know, the kind of food hall type piece, Lexi, that, you know, we're kind of looking to as we, you know, don't still want to you know, have large congregations of people, you know, you know, perhaps just in the restaurant space, you know, utilizing those local brick and mortar uh, you know, local you know, restaurants to augment you know, that service solution, I think is really, really valuable. It's great for our clients. It's great, again, for those community-based restaurants. And I think ultimately it really you know, supports that decentralized model. So really excited about that. Anything else for this uh, question? Okay. Sounds good. Let's, uh, let's go on to another um, another. Uh, angle on this on this topic. Um, if your clients' campuses or accounts were starting to reopen rapidly, let's say midsummer or early fall, um, are you looking at possibly hiring additional HR recruiting staff to help you hold regional job fairs and other uh, uh, job job type events or employment type events to restaff quickly that? Because it, it looks like companies and colleges and universities are all looking like mid to late summer or early fall to, to open in bunches. So it could steamroll very quickly for all of you. How are you, how are you looking at your recruitment staffing to, to handle that? Uh, Lexi, why don't, you, uh, why don't you take the lead on this reply, if you don't mind? Yeah, and um, absolutely, again, and uh, the concerning issue we have here is of course the timeline. Um, so many of our accounts are looking at reopening either later this summer or early into the fall. That is the same schedule that um, uh, the education sector is on. Many colleges have reported that they are all reopening um, come September. Um, the same with you know K through 12. And um, it, is, um, it is also timed with the stimulus package. It looks like it may run out um, early September. So there's a confluence of events there that is really um, um, creating a very narrow funnel for, um, for talent. And so with that, um, with all of those expectations in mind, um, we have already expanded our talent acquisition team and our regional account teams are al already also hosting um, Zoom open houses and conducting virtual interviews. However, um, we also have to be more creative than just applying those traditional methods of recruitment that we utilized in the past. Um, it's not just a matter of hiring extra resources we have to be more tactical in our approach to recruitment too. So what does that mean? 
Um, we are now recruiting using artificial intelligence, as Paul um, also alluded to as well. Um, our virtual job assistant is called Ally, and it, and it allows us to engage with candidates 24-7, answering quick questions and streamlining the application process. And um, we found that today's candidates won't complete app the application process if it takes too long or creates too much friction. So the process is now more clear and more concise. Um, we're also leveraging social media and various forms of recruitment marketing, which have become critical in our attraction of talent. And um, today's candidates today too are looking closely at company culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and branding when they are seeking employment. So we have to appeal to candidates on all of those levels too. Um, appealing to that sense of belonging for a candidate, um, also along with affirming opportunities for individual creative expression and long-term growth potential is really key beyond just the competitive uh, pay packages. So we're truly actively selling ourselves on every front. Um, in short though, to sum it all up, we are continuing to evaluate this war for talent for, from every angle and we will continue to adjust or add resources as needed as accounts reopen. So our virtual assistant's called Iris. Maybe we should introduce them to each other, but- um, <laughs> They're <so>. great friends. <laughs> No chat all day, literally. Um, so, you know, I, look, I, I think you know, we're, in a, we're in a similar vein there that the reality is, you know, job fairs work to a point. I think AI assistance work to a point. Um, but again, as we've kind of said before, you know, employer brand career is is kind of a material factor here. You know, timing is going to be very key. And then, you know, honestly, kind of the traditional approach, again, of being in the community. Right. We've um, been doing lots of transitions in, in recent weeks where we've just had you know, a team on the ground looking to recruit because you know, that expeditious nature um, of being able to do that is what's becoming most powerful. So I think it's a, it's a high tech and it's a low tech solution um, all around realistically. Well, it's definitely a touch solution. And our senior management has been very clear that it's everyone's job to be a recruiter at this time. It's everyone's job to be reaching out, not only to our employees and our team managers that we have had in the past and see how they're doing and keep touch with them, but also looking to others to transition into our industry uh, that may be interested. It's just everyone's responsibility at this point in our company. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Let, let me ask the panelists an off question real quick, uh, a side question. Do you, do you feel like the contract, our segment, the contract dining segment has a slight advantage over maybe other segments of the food service industry because of the, the nature of the scheduling for contract dining, uh, for employee dining, in particular employee dining, not maybe not necessarily you know, higher ed dining or healthcare dining, but the, the Monday through Friday schedules of the, um, of the employee dining segment. Do you feel that gives you a slight advantage in maybe in recruitment or, or not at all? I'll take that one a little. Industry. Sorry. Say that again, Lexi. No, I just wanted to clarify over the, over the restaurant industry. Correct, yes. Go ahead, Scott. Scott. Barry, I would say yes, because I know that that's, you know, a few years ago when I joined the organization after college, that's why I came into this industry because of the schedule and the fact that it lended to family life and having the holidays. And I thank God every Mother's Day that I'm not in those restaurants uh, serving. We just had one. Um, but the attraction of being there, there's also a great deal of creativity and individuality that our industry brings forward as we encourage one-on-one, -on -one. not that the restaurants don't have it, but there's a greater sense of that. And for me, it's always been a greater sense of belonging to something. Um, and, and I appreciate that. So I think there's a lot of distinct advantages in our industry um, that maybe are more attractive to many than the restaurant industry. Now, when I was 21, I may have felt a little different, um, but as I matured, I realized that our industry was the future for me. 
And I would say that we also have more appealing growth and development opportunities yeah. as well, at least as far as they are very clearly defined and we give our associates pathways to attain them as, as in the, the tuition reimbursement opportunities and, and other, um, other benefits that you wouldn't necessarily find in the restaurant industry as well. And I think in our industry, there's a greater length of full-time employees. So you're working the 40 hours. It's not the varied schedule of the 20 hours a week, every Friday, Saturday night, those types of things. So there's definitely advantages to that. I'll jump on the, the development bandwagon there. I, I just I think in our industry, you know, we can take pot washes to, you know, to be CEOs, right? I mean, I've, I've you know, come through the kitchen rank. I've moved into the dark side of management through my career. You know, obviously, I'm originally from Texas. You can tell by my accent. No, obviously, from the UK. <laughs> um, and you know, the ability to have a career like this in the food service industry, I think, is second to none. And I think that's really what this industry does. If you, if you invest in the industry, then it gives back, and the career development opportunities are huge. Right. Paul, that's so true. It's more of a career as opposed to a job. That is so true. Awesome. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, next question. If a significant portion of your new workforce ends up being brand new to the food service industry in general, how is your company addressing the need to train these new employees at the same time as onboarding all the other uh, staffing that you have to bring on quickly over the next three to four months to deliver the food service for your clients? So, Scott, we haven't uh, let you... Uh, Take the lead yet? Why don't you take the lead on this one? You can never keep me quiet, Barry. I'll keep going. <laughs> um, I, our engagement with our employees and training and our management has never stopped. So we have offered webinars right through this year and incentives for them to attend them, of course. Um, but we have tried very hard and have been very successful in keeping that engagement and training going forward. That said, we recognize that we're going to need to do even more. And so we're increasing the engagement that our new team has um, with the senior staff to make sure that they continue to get the feel, the family environment, and that the message is brought across. Um, our very senior team, our CEO, is interviewing everyone that is coming back in the management role and staying very engaged with their training as they move forward. We're starting early because we're, we know that there's going to be a lot more effort put forth um, to get that person into that philosophy as they move forward. We've also engaged some technology, and so not everyone has to go through every class. We're recording trainings, if you will, so that they can have them and so that they can refer to them, but then also utilize them. We've increased the number um, and put them um, on the web base so that they can go in, see them, the hourly employee in the unit, as well as the management team. Our managers are now becoming trainers. It's not just our director of standards and merchandising or, or anything else. It's really all about myself going into a unit and saying, let me give you some, let me give you some tips. Um, uh, it really is about, again, it's everyone's job to do so. We've also done a, a great deal of focus on making sure that our checkpoints and that our uh, training schedules are being completed as they move forward and that it's very encompassing of a lot of different aspects, not only about the food, but also about the client relationships that are built and the customer relationships that are there. And then, of course, there's been some training and will be continue to be training on new technology, which I know is one of our questions, but the, everyone's going to be involved in it. And so training and giving them background of that is um, paramount to what they're going to be forced forward um, and thrown into. And then also safety is a big, a big requirement. And so we are requiring everyone everyone to go through HACCP training and uh, COVID training, if you will, so that they, so that the employees, them as well as those that we serve, uh, feel safe uh, to utilize our services. And again, we're doing that through a web base um, and we're giving some incentives for them to complete those trainings. So um, there's a lot of different aspects to it. So in answer to your questions, everything is stepped up. Everything is accelerated. Everything has grown. Um, and we hope for a positive outcome as we move forward with it. Matt, anything that you've offered differently? 
No, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, part, part of the, part of the time that, you know, everybody was, was at home and not in the office. Um, we used that opportunity to really go in and codify some of our, our training, um, you know, pipelines and, and looking at um, how can we, as you mentioned, remotely train managers um, and frontline uh, employees to, to be able to um, solve problems that maybe had some more resources on site before. And so really using that time to create more, um, a, a, a greater knowledge base throughout the entire organization um, that's been very helpful as we've got to, you know, closer to um, a lot of offices returning to work because, uh, as you might imagine, um, you know, as people are all coming back, bandwidth is getting tighter and tighter. And so the expectation is that, um, you know, th there's, there's you know, a couple people are wearing a couple different hats, which is a great opportunity um, for them. They're learning things that they may not have learned otherwise, but we need to make sure that we have that training available for them so that as they move into, you know, areas that are a, a bit newer to them, they have the opportunity to excel in those areas. Yeah, and I think, you yeah, know, Scott, you covered a lot of bases there. Um, but I think, again, it's moved now, right? I think the reality is if you if you leave it another couple of months, you're not going to be ready. September's going to be here soon and it's not going to be September. It's going to ramp to September and and then September's where it's going to yeah. really, really take off. So, you know, I think advice will be moved now. And as we said earlier, Yo, know, it's not just about recruiting. It's about onboarding. It's about training. It's it's all of those things. So you need resource to support all of those activities. Absolutely. And, and, ahead, and Paul, I think it's it's also going to be about advancing forward. As you said, it's not only about September. It's getting that corporate culture going as we ramp up. Because as we ramp up, we're going to be hiring even more. Um, and providing more opportunity. So uh, it's just going to grow from September forward. Lexi? Yeah, no, um, absolutely. The, the timing is paramount here. Um, and so with this, this very large need to, to rehire and to staff up, we, we have also added additional resources and we've taken this time as well to reimagine and enhance our hospitality training and um, we've created a new program that is um, mandatory for all associates. So everyone that is a current employee has already been trained and all new, rehire, all new hires, it will also be mandatory for them to uh, complete this training. And it is lengthy, it, it takes a few days in total. And the goal would be is that um, it's done in person as much as possible. Um, but that is also in conjunction with the safety training that's, that's going to be required, so not only just as our standard practice, but also the enhanced COVID safety training, because um, our guests now more than ever um, are so in tune with safety and sanitation and um, being proactive about their own health, that um, that transparency is, is really key for us so that we can really provide this, this great guest experience that is safe and um, of uh, such a warm hospitality feeling that's going to really entice everyone back. So that's, that's the ultimate key here is enticing everyone back. <laughs> Lexi, that's a great segue actually uh, into our next question, uh, which was going to be about the post-COVID work, work uh, place and, and work era, if you will. And I was going to ask uh, the panelists, you know, how do you expect the guest experience will differ uh, when people start coming back to work and to school for that matter as well for higher ed accounts? How do your teams make this an even more attractive and enjoyable experience for the customer than before? So. Um, Lexi just gave part of an answer to that, but I was going to have Matt uh, ask Matt to take the lead on, on replying to this, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, I think the challenge right now is probably greater than ever around, improve, you know, really enhancing the workplace experience. Um, you know, there's been a lot of hesitation. We've seen a lot of reports come out that show that there's a smaller frequency of, or a smaller amount of people that want to actually go back into the office. Um, and, you know, when we look at workplace dining, uh, in the past, there may have been an element to it that was of, of convenience. But, you know, one thing that's happened in the past year is convenience in dining has been accelerated. So 
you can always find a convenient meal um, nowadays. And so now there becomes more of a, what does the experience look like at work and how do we cultivate that experience to make sure the, the you know, the fabric of our company culture is, is still intact. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the answer isn't, it's not to start when the entire office gets back, it's to be proactive um, and then and to ensure that, you know, as, as small audiences start going back and word spreads, um, obviously word spreads very quickly. And so those first uh, individuals that return to the office, we want to make sure their experience is, is, is as enhanced as possible. Um, you know, we talked earlier about how restaurants are working in the space to help uh, bridge that gap and be a bit uh, agile as companies return in smaller numbers. That's been a big part of it, um, obviously, for us. Um, and then, you know, we talked a bit about training, but in, in hiring, um, what we're looking for now is, you know, the people that we're hiring to manage these accounts have to be on the floor, facing the customer and really enhancing their experience every day. Um, you know, obviously working with local restaurants, there's maybe, uh, less of an impetus on, um, you know, scheduling personnel and, and some of the other, um, elements that come with a traditional program. Um, and so we're really trying to pivot in, in hiring, um, you know, managers that can really focus on the hospitality nature um, so that people are coming into the cafeteria every day. Uh, they're having a great experience. They're smiling, they're turning around, but they want to come back. Um, and so that's, again, that's, that's really been our focus. And uh, one of the ways that we've, uh, or one of the, the conversations that we've had with our, uh, the employers as they're bringing people back and, and being proactive. Okay. Yeah, there you go. The only piece I've had out there, Matt, is like, I think the, the visible sanitation side, um, our, our customers, rightly so, are going to be highly critical, you know, and that, you know, visual aspect to your regular cleaning, giving people peace of mind coming back, I think is going to be really, really key. So. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. And, so and also are- educating that customer as to what those what those techniques are. And it's not just about the signage, it's making sure that the team members are able to articulate what it is that they're doing and that they see it and that it's evident because we can all have signs out there and half of them get read. So um, I think building that confidence through actually uh, witnessing what is taking place is key. Okay. And and ultimately the guest experience has to be fun. Um, uh, I think a lot of the employees are going to be given the opportunity, the opportunity to choose in most instances, you know, to be flexible and to work from home or to come into the office. And, but, um, so many, um, so many guests have reported that the thing that they miss most about coming into the office is the amenity program. So that the food needs to be delicious. They need to feel safe coming in. And it needs to be fun um, first and foremost. So um, those are uh, those are certain certainly key elements as we look at you know returning and attracting everyone back. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have uh, one more question. I, we have some really good audience questions that we want to get to, but I have one more question for the panelists before we get to those, um, and that is about the technology factor that Scott alluded to earlier, um, and how has technology and or new applications shifted our industry in terms of the labor market? In other words, has Goat's Kitchens or pre-ordering mobile apps or mobile uh, ordering remote food lockers, um, has any of that helped uh, or, or shifted the change in the type of employees you're looking to hire and, uh, and, the, and the quantity for that matter? So Scott, I was, uh, was gonna let you continue your, your uh, discussion on this topic and, and lead the reply. Well, thanks, Barry. So the answer is yes, uh, that simply, but we really started out early in the year with trying to figure out how we were gonna eliminate uh, points of contact with each one of the operators, how we were going to provide the service without um, the contact, the direct contact, which is a real, um, change for us because we wanted that point of contact a year ago as we move forward. We also wanted to make sure that we were accomplishing efficiency in the labor force because the less people that were involved in producing whatever product it may be, the safer we felt it was at that time. And then of course, we're always looking for and trying to achieve client values, all of us, um, so that we can bring our value to that. 
um, we have really accelerated our um, research into the market of what is out there um, to bring forward. We're trying very hard to look into the storage of food lockers and how we can produce the food that someone can pick up. It, it reduces the contact and provides a, um, a little bit of a, um, a service. Um, in the same aspect um, as they're going forward. We've also looked to, uh, at smartphone apps. I mean, <laughs> I, I know I live and die by my iPhone and, and it is not only the iPhone because Apple's gonna contact me after this, but the, uh, the smartphone, if you will, what apps are out there and how can that benefit us as we move forward? We've also looked at um, delivery options um, and how can we deliver that without increasing the labor force, whether that be, you know, pick it up at a certain place or whether that be an, a, a, actually a robotic car that goes around much like the vacuum cleaners that were so popular about 10 years ago, a box, if you will, that goes around to the campus on a track. Um, that's our very latest and has the food contained in it and then folks can pick it up because they're notified on the phone that it's delivered. Um, we're also looking for new aspects of production efficiency in the kitchen. So we're looking for great pieces of equipment that are going to cut, dice, and chop as we're looking at the labor force and what we have forward. So to answer your question directly, yes, it has increased our, um, our need to really dwell into what is needed and what is out there and what we can provide value for and what the return of that value is um, to the client. I think there's so, on one point. Uh, all right, look, Barry, are you trying to move on to audience? Yeah, I, I'd like to, but uh, go ahead, Matt. No, I think, you know, uh, Scott hit on a couple of great points. And, and one of the things we've been talking about um, just a couple of questions prior to this is just the experience. Um, and for, for technology, I always go back to efficiency. You know, technology wouldn't be as, um, as fastly growing as it is unless there was efficiencies um, because of it. And so, you know, identifying efficiencies through technology, that's, that's kind of one of the big pieces. You know, I don't, I don't find technology to have a big ROI if there's not um, some sort of efficiency that comes from it. But then also um, data plays a big role in that. I look at data and technology kind of in the Absolutely. same lens. And what are we learning about our customer? We have to be very driven to understand the consumer through data so that we can make wise decisions about what our uh, customer wants every day. You know, if, they, if they're telling us over and over again, and we, ha we have the ability, we have this data to know what they're buying every day. And if they're telling us they don't like something, um, it's our responsibility to delight our customers. So we need to bring them back what they like and start eliminating the things we don't like um, that can't be driven by some initiative internally. Um, that has to be driven on our customers' demand. Um, so, you know, using that data has is, is been a big focus of ours throughout the um, uh, throughout the the pandemic, and it's what our engineers are focusing on, uh, and our data science team is focusing on heavily. Awesome. Okay, Let, let's get to some audience questions because, like I said, we've got a few really good ones. Um, Here's one that I was uh, interested in asking as head of sales for a food manufacturer who has many OCS CFS customers, what is the data on corporate workforces returning to the offices? I know many are moving to a flex virtual with occasional onsite uh, schedule. So food prep uh, for onsite will be limited. What does this mean for corporate food service and the percent expected loss predicted change in that sector? Um, and, and we've been discussing this in our planning sessions for the, for the panelists, and I, I think the question is a valid one because it also speaks to, for companies that are going to go to a hybrid station or a hybrid work schedule, how do you, how do you inform your food service operator on site of the schedule of employees coming on site each day so that they're not caught off guard with either way too much inventory or even worse, way too low of inventory for the customer, for the employees that are coming on site. So panelists, what do you think about, about this question about, what are you hearing about how people are coming back to office? I'll jump in. Um, so honestly, what we're hearing is, you know, without, you know, with all that flexibility, the actual kind of net change is almost minimal. A lot of your know, clients have, you know, particularly in, in new tech, 
you know, have ramped up in banking, have ramped up over the last 18 months, and they've got more employees, you know, than they had previously. And previously, maybe their real estate was almost at capacity. And so uh, I would take, you know, take that notion with a pinch of salt to say, I think it will be different. I think the ebb and flow of the business will be different, but we're not actually expecting material reduction in on-site populations. Um, you know, you've seen a lot of the communications from some very large tech companies out there, you know, talking about, you know, hybrid models. But again, I think, yeah, the, the, the proof's in the pudding, sorry, get a food pun in. Um, but you know, ultimately, you know, these, these organizations had challenges with real estate before. And I think they're not only looking at their food solution, but they're looking at their real estate solution as well. And overall in the industry, I think we're still going to see significant growth um, as we go forward. So many companies as well um, already had a work from the office um, practice. However, in our trends, our data, we would see that Tuesday through Thursday were the busiest days. And then Mondays and Fridays were potentially 30% of, of either of the other three days. So um, even in a hybrid work model, it, it's, it, we still expect to see a similar-ish type trend. But with all of that said, um, ultimately, different clients are approaching the return to work um, schedules and, and their mandates for their employees differently. So it comes down to, to flexibility and communication. If, um, if we understand what the communication is that's been given to the employee base, then we will staff and, and, uh, and propose a model that will um, be appropriate for, for that client. We're also being the best, the best part about, um, you know, while there has obviously been a, a dip in population into Paul's point, I don't think that materially there's, there's going to be a big difference moving forward. But I think what's really nice and unique is that there's a ton of conversation and engagement around food from yes. a lot of companies that maybe didn't put as much thought into it before um, are now putting a, a ton of emphasis on it. And there's a ton of conversations around it. And that's great. Um, for our industry, because we love what we do every day. We love serving customers and um, they're opening that channel of communication. So I think it's just going to enhance the overall programs. So even if there is a little dip um, potentially, you know, in, in one, one account or another um, overall, there's just a lot more engagement uh, in the industry overall. Okay. Let me get to one more question that I thought was really good for the panel. Um, this is from, an attendee with, it says, with, attra with attracting talent being such a large issue, has there been any thought to changing the business operation approach from multiple stations, multiple menu stations out front that all require staff to be more virtual concepts that can be centrally produced by one team in the back of the house? So who wants to yes, take a lead on that? The yeah. use of, of commissary models are certainly um, uh, in greater consideration now than they ever have been. And whether that is a ghost kitchen where we have the, the commissary model and then from that there are several different concepts and several different menus that can be ordered from and then delivered. Um, those are um, certainly very valuable um, solutions right now. And those are, as I mentioned, certainly being considered um, uh, in sites where they're appropriate. As well as packaging. Um, that's a big one that's come up as we all want to be as sustainable as possible. But packaging is a big part of that question. Um, and I, I think that it's something we're learning as we go. One of the positive things that, or many positive things that come out of this is I'm finding that our client base um, is very much a partner now. They don't have all the answers, not even how many folks are coming back. They're telling us what they think and they're looking to us to be experts, but they're also looking at us to be a partner with them, to be uh, flexible and nimble, um, to absorb those changes as they move forward. Uh, one other question, um, is your organization more concerned about management staffing or hourly associate staffing? 
I think honestly, hourly um, in a in a volume aspect. I don't mean to sound that as dismissive, but you know, I think just your pure volume again over the next six months is significant. So I think that presents the you know, probably the biggest logistical challenge. Um, but I think again, appropriate talent is is the key piece when we talk about management. And I think again, we've seen people leave the industry because they've had to make choices over the last you know, 13, 14 months. And so that is as much of a concern um, as hourly. But yeah, I think you know, the, the volume of hourly is the key factor there. Simply by numbers, there's more hourly than management to begin with. So right. um, simply by that alone, the focus is greatly um, on retaining and promoting those that are hourly employees and training them. Okay. Um... And then one quick question. I know I know we're running close to our time, so I, one quick question for the panelists. So, um, what is the timeline from the job from the time of job offer to active training and employment? As short as possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what time is it? What point can you yes. start? <laughs> can but, you start today? <laughs> but of course, you know. Um, the background checks and all of the logistics that go into the recruitment process do take time. Um, we have um, uh, in, engaged different vendors in order to be able to um, reduce that amount of time. But um, yes, the, the short answer right now is, is truly as short as possible. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that you're you're, you're recruiting, that you're then getting on site and doing training on site, you know, to be as, as prompt as possible. So completely agree with that. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Damien, I, first of all, I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists. Uh, for a very heartfelt thanks from myself to the four of you. Thank you so much. But Damien, I'm going to turn this back over to you to for some closing remarks. And uh, thank you. Hey, great. Thank you, Paul, Matt, Lexi, and Scott for an excellent session. And Barry, thank you for uh, serving as the moderator today for this session. A couple of things I took away just real quickly. Um, promoting the benefits of the work-life balance that our segment of the industry is able to provide is really going to be vital to us in attracting new talent. And that's really a primary focus within SHFM this year and why we continue to produce content like this and get this out to our members. So Again, very timely indeed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a 60 second evaluation for this session that will follow up in your browser through Zoom when the event ends. Be sure to share your thoughts with us as we continue to plan future SHFM events. Before we do sign off, uh, I do want to remind everyone about our upcoming SHFM events. To make it easy, we're going to put the link to the SHFM events page in the chat so you can find out more details about these events and register. Uh, we have Creating Workplace Hospitality Value Through Neuroimaging coming up on May 26th and our SHFM Town Hall on June 15th. And please save the date for our Conversations That Matter session, Neurodiversity, Let's Talk About It, scheduled for June 23rd. We're also looking forward to a couple of exciting in-person events later this year. So mark your calendars and save the dates for the Young Professional Summit in New York City on September 22nd. And lastly, the National Conference, December 6th through 8th at the Omni Amelia Island Resort in my hometown of Amelia Island, Florida. Plans are underway for an SHFM homecoming reunion event like no other. You can actually go online and book your hotel rooms for National Conference now. And we will put that link into the chat so you can find out more details on this and the conference itself. Thanks again, everybody, and I hope to see my SHFM family again real soon.